All right, so I'm with CrowdStrike. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, like I said earlier, we're going to play out that piece on that one. And we're going to present some just techniques on some past the hash mitigations. And these are things that you can apply to networks right now, this day, right away. Um, and there is nothing to buy here. I'm actually going to show you a piece of code uh, that we can sh share with you. Uh, there's other code that's not all in here, but I'll give you some basics on the code that we've developed, uh, ways that you can use that code in your environments, uh, and then some other pieces. And just from a like, show of hands, really quick, how many like, system administrators have people? Kind of. Red team, like pen test people? Blue team. So what's everyone else? Like uh, researchers or? Choose not to insert a name, choose your name anonymous. You're like, but I had to cover them, I'm telling you anything. All right, fair enough. All right, so just really quick, we'll just do that. We'll talk about, uh, and on the strong foundation, that's going to be more about just some practical, like these are everyday things you should be looking to do with your network. Uh, but the solution we'll be presenting will also be based upon if you don't get these things done, we'll still be able to protect your network. I like interactive sessions. If you have questions, you don't have to wait till the QA. Right, not to wait any of that stuff, like throw them out, let's have talk. This is about chatting, about learning, about communicating, about collaborating as a group. So, with that, um, the picture of my wife likes will be in a suit. Except I get to wear flip flops today, so that's all good. Uh, so, 15 years uh, doing this kind of work previously before CrowdStrike, I worked for a DoD contractor. Uh, spent uh, the bulk of that time fighting off APT. Doing advanced systems, designed uh, email scanning systems to detect uh, spear fish attacks, uh, specifically from uh, APT actors. Uh, so it was all in the defense industrial base. You can follow me at NetOpsGuru on Twitter. Um, I don't tweet that often, but there you know, I usually have one or two good ones a year, right? So I won't overburden too much. So just a quick overview so everyone gets uh, is on the same page for past the hash, people who may not know. So we'll talk about this in general terms. Uh, Exploiting the workstation, right? That's, uh, someone's going to be exploited. They're going to use a spare fish, and they're going to find some kind of leak. They're going to do something. They're going to get into the machine, and that's just going to happen. And when they do that, the thing they want to do is they want to establish lateral movement so that they can get deeper into the environment and capture more data. To do that, they need to capture credentials, or in this case, the hashes. Uh, so, a nice little graphic there. We're going to actually take the hash, we're going to send it back to our attacker. Attacker is going to have that hash, and, then, and for those who don't know, they don't have to take the hash and go off and use a big CPU, a big you know, video card system to break all these passwords. Once they have that hash, they can insert it into the process because they're typically running at an admin level credentials, admin on the box. They just insert into the process uh, that hash, and the computer goes, That's the correct hash, next for authenticating. What did you want? Right? It just gives you all the data. And with that, well, they're able to laterally move to the workstation, to the server, send the data back out. Big problem, right? And if you think about this whole process, this is where marketing's animation clicking is going to take me a moment. Let me get through here really quick. But, like in a standard process, I want an attacker gets hit, like they break into a network, they go through this process, and if you think about the area we're talking about, all this happens. They get their rat, they establish their command and control, they start the lateral movement. We're talking really far over here in the kill chain, right? We're talking at the end of the kill chain. And so if we could, and the thing is, is we're going to try to prevent them at that level. Because it's really hard to stop them from weaponizing an Adobe Acrobat document, right? You talk about security holes, Adobe's like the top of the list for the bubble environment, I think. Like, really the worst. That's hard to stop. It's kind of hard to stop. The delivery, they just send it to you through email. They weaponize the file, they send you an email, it's bad, right? It's they're gonna install their software because they already know it's gonna work. But if we can stop them from stealing a privileged credential from a domain admin, a server admin, anything with extra priv, a local administrator account, because how many times have we seen a network that every administrator account on every machine is exactly the same password? So if we can stop those pieces from being stolen, they're stuck. They can't laterally move. And if they try to move, it's really easy to see that in a log system or a process. And when we think about that, and where we sit in the kill chain, we talk about automated tools, right? Easy stuff, malware easy, spear fish easy. Through this process, these things are easy for an attacker to create. They can make a spear fish, they can take malware. But when you think about lateral movement, credential dumping, those types of things, that's really far off. If you can stop that process, very expensive for an attacker. 
right? There's 12 ways, I think approximately 12 ways in Windows to steal a credential. Whether you're done with LSAS, or you're going to do shadow copy to pull the NTDS like dip file off the, the, the server, off the AD server. There's like 12 total ways to get a, or a few. There might be one or two more I might miss there in the whole list of what they can do. But if you can stop that process, or at least prevent that, it's very expensive because how else is an attacker going to laterally move in your environment now? Now they've got to come up with a way to memory exploit a box, right? Find another vulnerability that isn't posted, right? That the CVAE hasn't released. It's another zero data, and that's the only way they can laterally move in the environment. Expensive, and hard, and noisy. Because if people are starting to bang on boxes on different ports and looking for memory exploits, other software is going to pick up on that. So the whole point here is, how do we stop lateral movement? How do we protect those pieces? Before we get to that, I want to get some just like computer network basics that I find is very hard for people to get into place. Uh, super frustrating for me. Uh, local administrator. When was the last time that you actually had to use the administrator account after you joined a computer to the domain? How many times have you had to do that in the past two years? I would say maybe once, maybe twice, but you could have found another way to do that. You could have done an image of the drive and capture the data off. You could have done all kinds of things. Microsoft, even in Windows 7, by default disables the local administrator account when you join it to the domain. And people have gone in and created group policy objects to re enable that account so they can use it. And attackers love that. They try to do the same password. You don't need the local administrator account once you join a computer to the domain. There's no need for this extra root account, basically, on every box. Let it be disabled, and then that attacker can no longer use that, that process. It's gone. It's a very simple thing to do, uh, and I would say that it, uh, it won't, it's not going to hurt you in any way, right? Um, so, and of course, one of my favorite quotes, the user is going to pick dancing pigs over security every time. Or, what was that, uh, the gerbils, right? Amsterdam, Amsterdam, that's it, right? So, uh, dancing, dancing hamsters, they're always going to go to Amsterdam before they worry about security. Uh, so, logging and alerting, right? I don't know very many organizations, but we go into organizations they've been compromised with the process. For some reason, the Active Directory servers, they don't seem to think they need to go to the same. Or they don't need to even like set it off to a logbook somewhere. Very important, try to get the logs, because once you have logging in place, after you put all this other stuff in place to protect the credentials, the logs expose the attackers to you. They have to try to authenticate, and with the way we're going to be working with the credentials, they will become noisy because they will be doing bad authentication. Uh, and if you just want to go on the cheap on this, which I totally get, uh, just buy yourself like a nice 2 you Dell server, throw a Kiwi syslog on it, and throw a syslog agent on your AD server and just stream it over there. Uh, right, and Kiwi Syslog, I think it's like 500 bucks, and you can do alerts for bad logins for your protected accounts, and you're good to go. It's not like you need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a gigantic SIM to pay on the side of your organization. In small organizations, you can spend very little money. You can probably find an old server you're not using that you just have storage on. Use that, throw Kiwi on there, set up some alerts for when these certain accounts log in after we set the protections in place. You're good to, good to go. The big thing there is the ability to alert and make sure that you're, you can alert to custom recipients. Like what I like to do is we'll talk about is forcing those with privileged accounts to be your eyes and ears when their accounts are used improperly. You provide the alert, they provide you eyes and ears. All right, so user workstation. This is really, really, really hard to get done. But in 2014, why does, and I'm going to do this in multiple type of OS terms, why does every user need local administrative privileges or root privileges to their own box? Right? You're managing an environment. They are supposed to be using an asset that you control, manage, patch. They don't need administrative rights. They get administrative rights. If you gave me administrative rights in your network, I would just call IT and say, hey, can you log into my box and fix something? And now I have the hash, because I'm an admin, of that IT person, and I can get to any computer in the environment. So in essence, if you think about from an auditing standpoint, from a rules standpoint, from when you think about different ways of you're required to protect data, giving a user local administrative rights technically gives them the ability to become domain admins 
All they have to do is get you to log into their box one time, and they can capture it with the tools that they have if they want to do that. So the next time a user pushes it back, you'd be like, now our solution won't require you to remove administrator rights to protect the critical accounts, but this is just something to think about. This, this is like that, if, if you don't have administrative rights, a hacker cannot take the credentials from the box. It is a, the minimum requirement. You must be able to have administrative rights on the box to capture the credentials or pass the hash to work. If you have user level access, you cannot do that. So push back on this, try to really get local administrative rights taken away from the users. For those that need it, because there are always going to be users that need local administrative rights, you've got developers. First, I like developers on their own virtual machines. Like they have their standard workstation, and that's where they do their email, web browsing, their standard day-to-day, -day, like, this is my business process. And if I want to do my cool dev stuff, I'm going to do that on my virtual machine. So I'm not blowing up my system all the time, and I don't have to have IT fixing this. So when I was a defense contractor, we finally got to the point where we removed all administrative rights from all users except for the engineering lab, which was in its own isolated segmented network. Help desk calls plummeted because users could not break their computers. And we actually spent more time then on security and less time on worried about user problems because it was all set up and ready to go. All right, the thing we've always heard that I say never gets done in environments, separation of duties. This is where we start to talk about the solution on protecting past the hash. In 2014, I say that there is no need for a single account in the Windows Active Directory network to have access to every computer. There is no need for a domain administrator to be able to log into every machine on the network. When you talk about a managed environment, first, domain admin, only for those absolutely need. What do you need domain admin for? Well, to create users, maybe make some policies, but mostly it's like to manage those domain controllers. And, I, and so I say, you know what? Just have them being able to log into the domain controller, absolutely fine. And if you've got to have if you need all these types of accounts, if you need a server admin account, a workstation admin account, we'll make you three accounts. And we're going to give you a process that makes that simple so you don't have to remember four separate passwords, or you don't have the user sending the same password on every account, because that kind of defeats the purpose too. Um, but then we talk about, you know, you layer up. Server admins, you break them up. The bigger your organization, the more you might break them up. You might have SQL admins, web server admins, but not every person who manages the server needs to get on every server. Segment the duties out. Separate the processes. Uh, this actually makes life really great when auditors come in again. You're like, hey, but who does he have access to? Well, he only has access to the four servers he needs to have access to, and his account can't go anywhere else. And if he goes anywhere else, I have an alert that pops up in my log if he tries. Um, but yeah, we must work on that se separation of duties. So you got them all separate. You're starting to do the separation, but how do you protect the critical accounts, right? Um, so. Actual group policy ways to do this. So this again, zero cost, right? You can deploy, you can deploy this today on a Windows network right now. Uh, you can create a custom security group, protected domain admins. You put, the, you put those domain admins you want to protect from this process into that there, into the, into the group, and then you've got the GPO that says, deny log on locally, deny log on as batch, deny log on as a service, deny log on through remote desktop services. And you apply that to all computers except for the domain controllers. Once the GPO is applied, any domain admin you stick in that security group now can no longer authenticate to the rest of the network. They can only authenticate to the domain controllers. Very, very simple. And now those domain admin accounts, those credentials, can't be used by an attacker to walk through your network. Uh, I think the last number I saw in with if I were to break into an hour with local administrator rights on a workstation, uh, it's less than 20 minutes to domain admin. No matter the size of the network, pretty much. It's 20 minutes to domain admin credits once the, you can start to capture credits. That's like the average process that the attackers are using. So a little bit of prevention is going to go a long way from the network, and especially because your users are going to get compromised. It's going to happen if they weren't at the so if the user gets compromised, they don't have local domain administrator, isn't it relatively straightforward to elevate their privileges by finding some vulnerability to get there? So you mean like local administrator? Right. right. They don't have local administrator. If you are properly patching to elevate those grids, it will require you to install some kind of malware or process. 
problem is if I don't if you don't have the local administrator, I can't just drop a service in. I just can't. <laughs> so typically, like they would attack the box that got local admin rights. They could start an interpreter session, right? Drop in a service that lets them uh, in, inject into LSAS. But if they don't have that, then I can't. I've got to find like a zero day that you haven't that or, or a vulnerability you haven't patched for. That's like, okay. like Flash or Java. Okay, so Flash or Java from a local aspect, that's going to be much tougher because it's still not running at its elevated permission level. It's running as a local user for process within their browser. Right? If I exploited a user and <coughs> had Adobe Flash in their browser, and I exploited the box, but the user's running as a user, I haven't elevated my process up to administrative permission yet. I actually have to find a hole in the OS. And the thing is, is if you're doing proper patching, I have to then come up with a zero day that I haven't told anyone about that no one knows it even exists, and then I'm going to elevate. Now, when we get to the process of the way the credentials are controlled, even if they did that, the credential they would get wouldn't be worthwhile to them. It's not going to be valuable, and they'll set off an alert in the law. So, can I cover that? Yes. Okay. Oh, wait, everyone in the back here okay? All right, perfect. So then we talk about that next layer, right? We have the, the server admin layer. Same, same process with the GPO, um, and you can break this out into different layers on which servers you want, but again, you basically do those same levels of controls. You only allow them to access into the servers um, from the group policy side, and they're recording this, so if you guys miss screenshots and you want to like read it, it'll be on YouTube, right? Yeah, so. That way you guys can grab the different information on the slides. Um, so again, you then let the server admins be administrators on only the servers they're allowed to administrate. Right? And then the same process with the GPO. And then we just talk into my favorite piece because what typically I've seen in organizations is you give those workstation admins, they run as domain admins so they can do workstation support because domain admins are automatically given permission it's all, it's all the computers, so it's just easier to give the workstation guys a management account, you trust them, and it's okay. But then the attacker takes those credits. So I always create that workstation admin group, make sure that they can only then control those workstations. If you're a large organization, you want to break up that process, you can actually then do segmented areas. You can say, okay, for my engineering department, I've got engineering admins that are my workstation support. And only they can log into engineering only. My IT guys over here, they're going to handle like finance and administration. You can really break up the process and control your environment through policy. <clears throat> That's very hard for anyone really to get around. So really quick, we haven't done anything yet to protect the credentials except for limiting where they can be used, right? So we're trying to disable the local administrator account. User permissions, trying to narrow those down to what's practical and best use. And domains are just to the DCs and servers are just to the servers and workstations. Still, you got a lot of police accounts, right? And everyone's like, wait, I think we've got four accounts and four passwords and all this other crazy stuff. Um, and the cache credentials are still there, right? They're still available to steal, inject into LSAS. The creds are still laying around the environment. If I get to them, I can still capture them. So I haven't really protected anything, I've just added a lot of overhead to an IT market. The other thing I have a question is, how many people run SCCM? SCCM is like hacker heaven, typically because of the way it's configured. Uh, we've seen a lot of attackers who will go to the SCCM server because I will ask this simple question, no one has to raise their hand, but the question is, in SCCM, is your SCCM deployment account a domain admin? Typically, that answer has been yes. Um, and if you are using an actual account to deploy the SCC agent, SCCM agent, out to the desktops, in today's threat world, I say you have configured SCCM in completely the wrong way. SCCM can be configured to use an MSI package through group policy to deploy the agent to the desktop. And then that desktop, once it's deployed, will actually do a pull of the information it needs from the SCCM server. Instead of doing a push out to the client, you let the, the agent do a pull from the server. You don't use an account to deploy the agent, especially an account that has administrative rights. This has become the default standard that people have used for SCCM. Attackers love it. They take over the SCCM box, and now they have an account that can deploy anything to any box in the environment. 
and nobody cares. Nobody goes, oh, that's bad because it's the SCCM user, and that looks like it should be normal. And if you do the, if you do that pull model where you deploy with the MSI package, you can use WSUS to automate the updates of SCCM and reduce the overhead of IT because when the new SCCM update comes out, you deploy over the WSUS server, and your clients automatically update by themselves with zero IT involvement except for the initial push to the update server. So really think about those SCCM and any other software deployment systems you use, and get that to a point where you're not using an account with administrative rights to push out to your endpoints, because hackers will use that against you and take over your network with it. All right, so automated credential expiration. Hey, the way we do this is we actually limit the validity of those cache credentials. Um, one of the easiest ways we found to do this is with a web application. I will show you some pieces of code. Um, you guys can reach out uh, to me later to get some additional pieces. Um, grab a card or whatever, email me. We'll give you some more ch chunks of the code so you can build this on your own applications. Uh, but it's a simple web application. So what we do is we take it, we build one server that we protect, right? Protect really well. We'll put like, like our own Falcon host on that, or you can do Bit9. There's different ways that we can monitor those processes. But you have to protect one box and we put two-factor authentication in front of with a simple web application. Um, and then when your user logs into the process, they presented three specific choices in this case. You can do more depending on how you lay out the security controls. But your administrator logs in and goes, which account do you want? Your domain admin, your server admin, or your workstation admin? And then once they choose the account they want, you randomize the password. And it's given to them right there, and it's given to them with an ex expiration time. Typically, we'll start in the neighborhood of four to eight hours. Eight hours is always good. Like, they can deal with an account in one day. That's all they really need. And then this way, they don't have to remember passwords. We're just going to generate it on the fly uh, through the process. The other thing, too, is while we're doing this, we can actually log who logged in, what's the account, what password, oh, they're given a password, who asked for it, and you can send them, like, an email just to validate that they're supposed to get the password. But what we do with the little special, if you can't, everybody can see that okay? I can zoom in if we need to zoom it in. So, but what we've done is within, within this piece of information here, this is our, our directory object basically as we pull the user, we set the expiration date on the account. The expiration date's really great because it transitions to all the DCs. Uh, so that expiration date then we set with an eight hour time period from when they initiate the request, or four hours, or two hours. You can have a job and log in and expire it later. But the account's only valid for that period of time. Even if the attacker were to get the credentials the next day, the credentials are no longer valid. No matter what you do with the account, the credentials are no longer valid. But your IT department only has to log into a portal once to do their process and start the day, and they get, they get their crowd, they can do all the work they need to do, the attacker, when they get the CRAD and they, the next day try to use it, they set up all kinds of alarms, right? Because you have all the logs. So the users are basically controlling their cache credentials, not going to expire it. And we put this in place, I think, uh, four organizations now that we've done incident response with, and they love it. Matter of fact, one of them took it to the extreme and they have like seven server groups. Two different, like a domain admin, seven server groups, and three workstation groups. And the auditors came in the other day and they're like, hey, and they're like, oh no, here's the audit logs, and these are the only people that can get on, and their passwords are never good during these periods of time. And they're like, okay, so should we go out to lunch because your audit's pretty much finished because your all your privileged accounts are getting controlled in just this amazing fashion. Um, and then we talked about the log alerting. So you alert users on that privileged account usage. Well, either when its account is generated or account is used, they know that they use the account. So that way, if like your vulnerability here is the four-hour window when the account is actually valid, an attacker would have to hit you on a box that you used within the four-hour period and grab your credential and then use it without you alerting on it to a person who would say, I didn't do that. The chances of an attacker having any kind of extended level of access to a network is very minimal. The chances of you detecting an attacker quickly is very high. So, and also, they don't get that period of time to laterally move throughout your environment and establish multiple layers of like, access into the system. So, it's just a lot less work. Um, 
Whether this is like a lot less business for us because you don't need this to come out and do like your entire environment remediation. You're like, hey, I've got like three computers I think they got on, or like two. They had, like, they had access for about an hour. Can you use some forensics on this for us? Because, well, you know, we don't. Right? So, this is a great way to secure your environment from a lateral movement type process. We zipped through this very quickly. So, Credentials are restricted to those to the needed assets, different control pieces we put in place. They have limited valid validity. The lateral movement capabilities are significantly reduced, right? All the business processes still function correctly. There's nothing that really changed. I mean, you, the, the next step to this is to take those service accounts you've got for your SQL servers or any other services you're running in the environment and make sure that you narrow down those capabilities on the service accounts. Look at them and go, hey, that service account really, it doesn't, it only needs to be able to log into this one machine, it has to be able to run these three processes. I don't need to give it actually server admin that. I can really limit down what it has access to and the way this capabilities work. But really think about just giving the accounts just what they need to run. Um, and then you provide logging and alerting on those potential credential path. And the nice thing is it's really almost no cost. It's not like I said, hey, here's a solution for you that you gotta buy, I mean like 10 grand, please. It's, it's a small amount of labor, it's some process change, and it's just some, a new way of thinking about how do we control privileged credentials in our environments today, right? It's not about, it's not about we need rights for everything, it's not about, um, you know, users don't have to be able to do everything they want on their box. Um, and if you move into the BYOD type thing, you're joining the users' personal computers to networks and they're using their passwords and you're typing your passwords on the box, which I know is a very popular thing these days. You don't want your credentials being typed into a box that you don't know, unless you're going to be expiring them because you don't have no idea what's running on the box. And you, I mean, I, my wife works at a university and she uses her personal computer from home and they connect her to the network printer and they come and type information on there for her. And I always wonder, what if I captured memory and did a couple other things? I mean, just think about the, the things that you leak around the information. Protect those privileged accounts, expire them, get rid of them, but still function as a business. So, we talk about the calculus of disruption, the, the OODA loop, right, with the fighter pilots. It's always about being able to, to just observe, orient, decide, and act faster than the attackers, right? When they can go faster, they beat us to the punch. Um, when we can go faster, we secure the environment. When they, in this essence, we're securing the environment so quickly the attacker can't get the credentials they need to laterally move, so they're stuck. And if we come back to what we talked about, the raising cost of the Addison's area, we talked about this process. If you take out that lateral movement section, that privileged capability there, the attacker is really stuck, like you mentioned earlier. They gotta come up with that zero day now on the OS. That's an expensive prospect. Not to mention, as soon as they burn that zero day, if someone figures out about that zero day, they lost that zero day, and I have to come up with a new one. And I know they have a stack of zero days just waiting to be used, but they don't want to use them, but they don't have to because it's expensive. And the, and the more we make them spend, the less that they're going to want to use, the less that they'll want to attack. And like they said earlier, we talked about the, the previous talks and talked about, you know, you want to just be faster than the guy behind you to be there chasing you. Um, in this case, when an attacker comes in, you make your network hard to work on, Attackers will go find an easier network, right? And they're gonna go try another network because it just is like, okay, it's not worth it right now, we'll come back later, do that process. Uh, the other big thing we like to talk about is, you know, we got a lot of people said, you know, we're this hack back company, we get that early when we were in our stealth mode. Uh, but I always say that on your network, it's your network, right? It's your environment. You can make it as hostile as you want it to be. Your users, as long as they can function, that's fine. You want to make it possible for attackers? You want to segment off? You want to make you know all these passwords expire? It's your network. What, what are they going to do? Like make it hostile. Be a pain. Don't don't be don't do M and M security right. Hard outer shell, soft in the middle. Like I mean that's like we see that all the time. We're like we got IDS, we got firewalls. You know we got all these network detection devices. And I'm like yeah, there's nothing in the middle. You're not doing anything in the middle, and you've got a flat network and. This network connection in Australia can connect to New York and it's straight across and it's all flat because, well, it's just easier for the users and the engineers to have access to everything. Well, it's also easier for 
the attackers to have access to everything. And they're glad to leak it out other points that you don't know about. So we see that all the time. Always try to protect, right? <coughs> In conclusion, even though past the hash has been around forever, I said earlier it's like like Windows, like it was Chicago, right? Code name for Windows 95, past the hash started Chicago days. Uh, it's real threat still today. It's not solved. It still is used, uh, and most any networks are susceptible to the attack. You can protect it, right? Um, and we've used this solution to protect other networks. Uh, flat up, you can't use an expired threat. I don't care what you do. You can't use an expired credential. You're going to have it go. You're just going to be notified. Um, actually, uh, I need to restate that. We'll talk about that in just one second. Technically, there is one way, which we'll talk about. If you have not heard about Golden Ticket, we'll talk really quick about Golden Ticket. So I guess you could say it's technically expired. Uh, but, and then alerts will notify of credential usage. And this, I say, is this is an affordable solution for any business. Uh, so really quick, before we hop into any questions, uh, Golden Ticket, if you have not read up on Golden Ticket, uh, EU Cert released a great uh, write-up on Golden Ticket. Uh, and some of the issues with that. Uh, so, if an attacker were to take your Active Directory database, which is very easy to do with volume shadow copy, uh, so you do a VSS copy off your uh, domain server when you have admin level credits for the domain, uh, they can, the Mimi Cats is a great example of this, they can generate a Kerberos ticket uh, with its initial validity good for 10 years. And you're like, oh, well, that's okay, I went and I reset all the passwords in the environment, I'm good to go. But the Kerberos ticket is still valid for 10 years, even after you reset the passwords. So no matter how many times you reset the password for that Kerberos ticket they created, or whatever, whatever account they created it for, the ticket's still valid. Uh, they have to use the NetBIOS name instead of the IP address. You just have to use the NetBIOS name, and it goes, yep, that's a valid Kerberos ticket. I'm good to go, thanks. Uh, there is uh, one special account in Active Directory. It's the KRB or TTT account. account. But you can't, no, you can't delete it because that's the ticket generation account. You've got to have it. You have to change the password on that account to make sure that that ticket is expired. And you have to change that password twice. So if you ever have an attack on your network and there's a possibility that they took your Active Directory database, make sure you reset that Kerberos account twice uh, so that the attempt, so any time, any Kerberos tickets that they created using those techniques for Golden Ticket, that way those tickets are no longer so, KRBTGT, I believe. So, if you go look up EU CERT, if you, if you look, pull up my Twitter feed, there's a link to the EU CERT doc. So. so, thank you. Uh, I'll take any questions on password hash or all that process. Yeah. Well, trying to visualize this. So, basically, you obviously the users will be down and access to the boxes. Unless they're wanting to install a tool and want to install any. Yeah. So, like, you've got your system operations team. They're going to have to get into every box, or at least every box that they're responsible for, and they would log into this guard, well, this guard well, server that, and, then, and then check out credentials for the day. Okay? Well, it generates them, uh, so it, it, it activates their account uh -huh. and, and then gives them their password for whatever period of time you want to give them. Okay. You probably have to make that public because if they have to get into the home, or at least the You make them VPN in with their normal account first. Oh, I see. So the whole point is, is never use a privileged account outside of an environment, outside of an area that never needs to be used. Right? So VPN with your normal account in from home, access the web portal, say what's my password, thank you. And then you would do your work. Yeah. And then the other thing that's nice, so we've seen a few companies add on the back end of that is, after they're done with the process, they have the person log back into the portal and on the level of account, and actually expire the account right then. Right, so that way they don't even have the window of time. It's only good for the actual specified period of time. So, and um, if you just like reach out, um, you can always like I can reach out and help with some of the code pieces that we've implemented. So we've got people use uh, RSA two factor and also use do up. We've got two factor VIP. So, but yeah, any other questions? <coughs> 